Here are two more poems by William Blake, and these two were designed to be read together. The first one is about the tiger. I, I don't know anybody who has ever spelt tiger in such an extraordinary way, T-Y-G. I suspect William Blake is trying to make it sound old-fashioned, mystical, magical, threatening. And the other poem is about the lamb. And both of these poems are loaded with biblical and classical allusions. See if you can pick those out and we'll look at those in more detail when we come to the analysis. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp? Dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life? and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead, gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly white, gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name. For he calls himself a lamb, he is meek, and he is mild. He became a little child, I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name, little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. Now both poems are about evil and creation and God. In the first poem... It's about how, how did evil occur in the second poem. It's about the triumph of good over evil. They were written in 1794, and they are part of the songs of innocence and experience. And the problem of evil, I was going to say the problem of evil is a medieval obsession, but in fact it goes all the way back to Epicurus the sage, this amazing Greek philosopher that we don't know very much about. Uh, we don't have very many of his writings, just little snippets. And uh, what other people have said about him, and other people said that he was very interested in the problem of evil. If God is all-powerful, and if God is all-good, how could God allow evil, or how could God create evil? And a later philosopher described this as the inconsistent triad Evil. Evil, a good God and an all-powerful God. So if God is all-powerful, he should be able to stop evil. And if God is all-God, if God is all-good, he shouldn't want evil. So something is wrong. Evil cannot exist with an all-powerful and all-good God. That's the problem. And the first poem particularly focuses on that. Now, some people have solved the problem of the first poem by saying, ah, yes, the first poem is about the tiger, and the tiger was created by the devil, by Satan. I'm not so sure that William Blake is being as clear as that. I think he is deliberately being ambiguous. And that really is the point of the poem. How can we reconcile the creation 
of this frightening monster, the tiger, or the velociraptor, if you want to think of this in terms of Jurassic Park, with the image of a beneficent god. How can a good god create a monster that's only purpose is to devour, to terrify, to eat us? And yet, this monster is very beautiful. This monster burns brightly with symmetry. The idea of flame could be something which is terrifying, could be something which is frightening, but it's also something which is warm, which is the centre of the hearth, the centre of the home, which for William Blake is the source of creativity. It's an image of creativity. It's an image of design, of passion and symmetry. Uh, orange, black, orange, black, orange, black, as he walks past the trees, this fire uh, caught in the forest. And the symmetry, uh, William Blake says, could frame thy fearful symmetry, could frame. Uh, William Blake is talking about a picture here, isn't he? And William Blake, remember, was an artist was an etcher, was a painter, was a drawer. He would know all about framing pictures. Could frame, could hold, could define. How could we define God? How could we define evil? How could we impose restrictions on God? It burns brightly with symmetry. It's beautiful and authentic, the framing of symmetry, exactly like a drawing or an etching, that is pure Blake, and it's built on purpose. Uh, the purpose comes with effort and with skill, and we learn all about that in the middle stanzas, the idea of the blacksmith beating out the heart. But its purpose, its purpose is to kill. Is it possible, therefore, that the author of this evil monster is not God himself at all, but is the devil? It's miraculous and dangerous. It's terrifying. It's defiant. A daring creation by God or by Lucifer. I would strongly uh, argue that it's by God. I would strongly argue that the creation of this monster is God's because without fear and danger there would be no love, joy or remorse. So that Zoroastrian balance, that perfect balance between perfect evil and perfect good, between the tiger and the lamb, I think is not what William Blake is looking at. But it's definitely there in the poem if you want to go there. Now I said there were classical allusions uh, flame, who brought the flame from heaven to earth? That's Prometheus in the classical story. The titan Prometheus steals the flame from heaven and takes it to earth and gives it to us. Uh, there's a lot of gifts going on in both these poems, by the way. And he gives us the flame and for that he's punished. And Zeus, the king of the gods in Olympus, sends down his eagle daily to peck the liver from... Prometheus, who is nailed to the rock, and daily the liver grows, and so each day the eagle comes back to a new and refreshing feast. And this is, of course, also an image of Satan, who is being punished on an eternal basis by God in hell. And you think of Satan in that great poem, Paradise Lost, by John Milton, and William Blake illustrated Paradise Lost. So, the image of Satan, that anti-hero, that uh, uh, proto-Batman, is very much in William Blake's mind. Uh, of course, in uh, Paradise Lost, the great titan of Satan starts off nobly and eventually, by the end of the poem, is little more than a rat, a snake. The way the poem works, it's got a strange beat, it's got a strange rhythm. Most poems in English are iambic, that is ba-bum, 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 with the stress on the second syllable. That's natural English speech. This is trochaic with the stress on the first syllable. Bum-bum, bum-bum, tiger, tiger, burning, bright. And then you expect another, another beat, but you don't get it. This is a 
catalytic final beat. So tiger, tiger, burning, and then that extra beat, bright. Not brightly, bright. And that extra beat is in all but four of the lines of this poem. And five of the lines are actually iambic. Five of them are iambic. So a line which is iambic, for example, and when thy heart began to beat, ba-bum, 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 iambic, ba-bum. And when thy heart began to beat. But for the most part, this is a trochaic beat. Uh, we've, we're, there's many things that we've looked at in the past, like epizoixes, you find that, uh, tiger, tiger. But, but also, here you've got apostrophe. William Blake apostrophizes. Uh, he addresses the tiger personally. And, the, and there's also personification there. Tiger, tiger. And then there's a comma. It's an address. But when the lines are repeated in the last stanza, that address is removed. It's then a statement. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. Um, and the, the forests, what are the forests? Well, that's, uh, th th that's a wonderful idea. The forests of the night. We might be thinking of Siegmund Freud and Jung. Uh, so deep psychology. How can we penetrate the forests of the night? Uh, the forests of the night, like the... Like, 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 like the Puritan young Goodman Brown in Nathaniel Hawthorne's story, or, or, or the grim fairy tales where so many of the characters leave the comfort of their home and go out into the forest, out into the wood, to challenge themselves, to uh, challenge, to, to meet their destiny. Uh, so the forest of the night is this area, this mysterious area of creativity, but that's also... Blake is asking him what part of the brain is that creativity? How do you, how do you find evil? Surely that if you are creating evil, then surely you must be evil yourself. You cannot create or manifest something that isn't already within you. So the poem is not really about the tiger. The poem is about God. In what distant deeps or skies, the deep. Now, again, those people who say this poem is all about the devil about Satan, would say the deeps are the deeps of hell and the flames of hell. Flames uh, go all the way through this poem. But the deeps is a, is a word which occurs in, uh, twice in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, uh, the word tehom in, in Hebrew, the deep or the deeps, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And it's also used in the story of the flood, when Noah builds his ark and the fountains of the great deep broke up in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. But the word deep also is a technical term. And the Gnostics, these strange people, I remember uh, William Blake was also a Gnostic. He believed, like Plato, that there was a difference between the physical body and the spirit. The spirit is good, the body is bad. And in fact, in some uh, of his illustrations, he thinks of two different gods, a, a good god who makes the spirit and a bad god who traps the spirit, encases the spirit in the body, limits the spirit. And the Gnostics, the, the Gnostics developed an entire religion out of Plato's thoughts um, about the spirit and the physical world. And, uh, for example, the Mandaean scriptures would think uh, not, not only that Tehom was a sort of primordial god, sometimes called Ur, or Leviathan, who married Ruha, the mother of the seven planets and the twelve constellations, uh, but this, uh, the, 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 this, this god was also the god that in some form created as well, manifested, the prime, uh, manifested out of the primordial chaos, the tohu bohu, manifested order. Uh, so that, that chaos, that chaos is potential life, the chaos in your mind, 
when you when when you when you're doing a spider graph, the, that chaos is a potential essay. And uh, and another word for tehom in the Gnostic scriptures is sheol, and sheol becomes in the Judeo-Christian world one of the words to describe hell. So you can see how that movement from uh, God to Satan is already there linguistically. So you're not wrong to identify the author of the tiger as Satan. I just don't agree with you. Uh, I think William Blake is talking about the mysticism, the mystery of God. Remember, William Blake is a mystic. He is a prophet. He's not, he's not going to let you have this easy. There, this isn't a crossword and there's a simple answer. This is, all, this is a mystical manifestation of his ideas and it's not supposed to be solved. It's supposed to remain a mystery, a little bit like apophatic theology. Apophatic theology is the theology is the theology which is based on what you cannot say about God. How do I how do I define God by negatives? He is not here. He is not evil, and so on. And in many ways, William Blake is playing that sort of game with words. He's throwing words out as attempted explanations, not as solid definitions. And when God is, or, 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 or when the, uh, the, the, the character with wings, is that God, is that, a, is that an angel, or is that the wings of Lucifer, Satan, but whoever made that tiger, it comes back to God as the ultimate source of all creation. All living creatures depend on God's will. All living creatures express God, God's will. And God is seen in all creation. And that is the irony and the oddness of this. And, and where about, in the middle of the poem, we get this direct reference to the fall of Lucifer, I think. And when the stars threw down their spears. Now, is that the moment where the, where the angels, the stars, another image of burning fire, where the stars are threatening each other, or is that the moment where they throw down their spears in surrender and water heaven with their tears? Um, it's not, it, again, it's not entirely clear what Blake is getting at here, but it is a reference to that primordial fight in the heavens, that celestial flight, fight between the angels of good and the angels of evil before the creation of the world. And... Uh, that, that image, that image of the, of the stars, another, another instance of personification, that image of surrender. Is the, dev is the tiger then a creation of defiance by Satan, or is the tiger a creation by God as, uh, uh, as an, inspired by the experience of war? So God may be, like the tiger, violent, vengeful, fierce, or he may be, like the lamb, as we're going to come across, uh, meek and mild. He may be a being of fire, like the tiger. That may also be a being of hell, created in the fires of passion, created also in the industrial forge, part of the Industrial Revolution, every town, every village, every city would know the sound, the beat of the hammer on the anvil in the blacksmith's forge. And here we've got the blacksmith straining to beat out the heart of the tiger like some great machine that cannot be stopped. And William Blake is not a great fan of the Industrial Revolution. This poem begins and ends with a paradox. How could a good God create this monster? How dare a good God, or how dare, how dare anybody create this monster? Who dares? And Blake doesn't really tell us. 
And the paradox is there in the second poem, The Lamb. And the lamb emphasizes the paradox as well. Here, this innocent, this weak, this, um, uh, this, this almost insignificant animal is also godly. More than that, this, uh, as in um, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Lamb. And the Lamb is meek and mild. He became a little child. Uh, remember Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 5, The meek shall inherit the earth. Here is, here is the, uh, the animal that inherits the earth. And that relationship of harmony between us and nature, between God and us. And that link between the, li uh, the lamb and children. Because children for Blake are innocent and are born into innocence and are corrupted by the Industrial Revolution. And we should have, Blake thinks, the values of children, the values of wonder and simplicity and joy. And, of, of, of course, this poem, uh, I pick, pick, some of the features here, you've got the diacopy, um, uh, the, uh, the repetition of the delight and the voice, uh, gave thee such a tender voice gave the clothing of delight. But those gifts, think of those gifts rather like the gifts which are given to the Christ child in the crib by the wise men. They gave gifts, uh, or incense, frankincense and myrrh. And, and, and here these uh, gifts of delight. Um, Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales, making all the valleys rejoice. Mead is a meadow. Uh, little lamb who made thee. The, the, this repetitive uh, nature of this second poem is very much uh, in memory of a great prayer which is uh, recited or sung during the communion service in the Catholic, in the um, Anglican, Lutheran churches, the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, but it also reminds us, uh, this idea of the childness, ch childishness, reminds us of that one verse in uh, Luke's Gospel, I think. It's the only verse which talks about the childhood of Jesus um, and uh, it says, um, chapter 2, verse 40, the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And here you've got the wisdom of innocence, the, the, the strength of the spirit, and the grace of God in this one small animal who is also identified as a child. Now, uh, to go back to some of the other details here, you've got the, um, you remember anaphora? You remember in the, in the poem London, um, in every cry, in every infant's cry uh, of fear, in every voice, in every ban, in every, in every, in every, that is anaphora, where, the, where you've got a, rep a repetition of a bit of a phrase at the beginning of the line. But if you have a repetition at the end of the line, that is epistrophe. And here you've got it with the expression, who made thee, little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know? Who made thee? It's a lovely sense. And uh, that, that, as I say, that repetition goes all the way through the poem. A, a, a thought that comes to my mind is that this might, um, uh, William Blake might have been thinking of uh, Charles Wesley, the, um, the, the, the great hymn maker in, the, um, in English, uh, he's got a, a, a hymn, uh, Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon this little child, pity my simplicity, 
suffer me to come to the actually I'm not sure whether I, I'm, I'm not sure whether Charles Wesley wrote before William Blake I, uh, um, maybe you have to strike that but uh, check it out anyway the, this, this idea of the lamb this idea of the tiger this contrast between the two and I would suggest both the tiger and the lamb represent God but I would suggest also there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of room for thought and discussion and uh, I've not really done very much analysis of the text, but I think we're running out of time. So for now, let's leave it at that.